Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. Take a deep breath. Relax, because you got this. Well, that's the name of the new book. Just hit store shelves. It's written by Lois Goudeau. And I get to find out all about this book. Lois is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Lois, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell me all about Take a Deep Breath, Relax, Because You Got This? Lois, what can readers expect here? Okay, so this book, it's insights to motivate, inspire, and support individuals on their blended family journey. And it's a book for that, to help people that are in either a step-parent or even a bio-parent. Even though it's for blended families, a lot of the information can apply to people that are in two-parent households. Hmm. Well, Lois, how were you inspired to write this? What gave you the idea? So I never, first of all, I never thought I'd be an author. That wasn't something that was on my bucket list. Mm. <laughs> but I'm a therapist. And one of the things that I found that as I was counseling a lot of my clients, they were having issues with blended families. And see, I knew that was my experience. My experience in a blended family started 28 years ago is when my first husband and I, we decided to divorce because of differences that we were having. And so I was left with two kids. And so I didn't think about, you know, the blended family. I thought it would be like when I met someone else, like initially, like when I met my husband. But then when I met my current husband, I realized that blending a family is a very unique journey, mm. very unique journey. So the first, I'd say two to four, maybe five years, we really struggled in our blended family. We actually separated twice wow. because we just couldn't get it together. You know, there was not a lot of resources out there. And even though I know that there are resources out here now, but the issue is that there are so many different types of blended family. To kind of find one that kind of fits what you're going through is still a challenge today. But anyway, so back then, we're Christians, so we went to our pastor to try to get some counseling. Our pastor had never dealt with blended family, so all the information he gave us was related to just being married, but not having that blended family piece there. Hmm. Then we went to counseling in the community. And again, that counselor, even though they had the terminology and they had studied about blended families, they hadn't been in the blended family. It's sort of like you don't have the experience, but you have the information. And mm. that's what it felt like because the person really couldn't help us. And so when I was counseling my clients, it's like it took me back to when I didn't have that information. And so as I was counseling my clients, I realized a lot of them didn't have mental health issues. Although being in a blended family can cause you anxiety and depression, it could lead to one. But really, they needed more coaching and how to deal with the blended family. And so I knew I couldn't reach everyone in counseling, but with this book, I could reach uh, many more people. So that's why I decided to write this book to help people in an area that I once struggled in. That's fantastic. You're definitely filling a need here, Lois. So you're a first-time author. This is your first book? This is my first book. Actually, it's my second edition of my first book hmm. because when I first put it out, you know, different friends and family, they got it. And they're like, you know, Lord, this is so good. Why did you stop? <laughs> you know, because it's not a really thick read. And so I revised it and I added a couple more chapters to it. And so, yeah, even though it is my first book, it's the second edition of being a first time author. And it's quite the learning experience, which I'm sure you're well aware of, Lois. So did you pick up anything along the way that you think would be really useful to the first-time authors listening? Well, when I did it the first time, I actually did it myself. You know, I can go on Amazon and do be a self-publisher. Mm. But I realized that, you know, I tried to get into some book stats because I wanted to get out there. And so some of the feedback that I got back from some of the people that were there, and it wasn't critical, but I took it as a positive. Because they said, why don't you get the book edited? Because if you want to kind of put it out there in the mainstream, they want to have it edited by professionally edited. So I did have it professionally edited. And that's really one of the reasons why I did do that second publication when I added a couple of chapters. And then since I did that second revision, I mean, it has just really exploded. You know, like mm -hmm. different people are saying, hey, I saw your book. So it's like really out there. Whereas before, it was kind of hard for me to promote it. But when I went to Christian publishing, it seems like it's just really taking off. 
Well, this is definitely a much-needed resource for blended families. Again, the title is Take a Deep Breath, Relax, Because You Got This. It's written by Lois Goudeau, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. So get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or walk down the street to your local bookshop and you'll be able to pick it up. Well, Lois, thank you again for coming on the show and and telling me all about this really important book. I really appreciate it and had a great time. Thank you so much for allowing me to talk about my new baby. The book I'm looking at right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is all about sibling friendship and love. It's titled My Little Brother and Me. It's written by Alita Glenn, and I get to talk all about this book with Alita. She's right here with me now. Alita, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here with me tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Well, the pleasure's all mine. Alita, can you tell me all about My Little Brother and Me? What can readers expect here? Well, My Little Brother and Me is an experience brought to life, to sibling, learning to, you know, form a bond that will last a lifetime. Mike and Joe are the two characters, their siblings. Mike is the older sibling. Jojo is the younger sibling. And so it's a wonderful experience to read and, you know, have these words come to life through the illustration of these two brothers who are, you know, going on this journey that forms a bond that, you know, we can all learn from collectively as we read and we, you know, dive into My Little Brother and me. you'll see the different, you know, things that they are able to get over on a daily basis. That's mm. sibling tasks and friendships, you know, how to resolve little problems and squabbles. But it's about the love that is created within this book. And I hope you enjoy it. Alita, did you have an idea of what kinds of readers that you were speaking to here? Who do you think would enjoy this the most? Well, my readers are young readers. You know, between the ages of five and seven, who can read to their younger siblings as well. The illustration speaks for itself. So it is geared towards more younger readers who would mind, you know, they can use their imagination to foster an understanding of this book based on their reality in which they have their younger siblings as well. Hmm. Can you go back and and think of that time you got the spark, you got the inspiration to say, hey, I want to write this book. I want to get this published. It went back to the pandemic. I was remotely and my children were home with me as well. So that really gave me that light bulb moment because at that point, I'm getting that epiphany of how they're really getting along with each other during the day. And I'm like, wow, you know, this is amazing to see, you know, how they correspond with each other on a daily basis. We're all stuck in the house. So that was a moment where I'm like, let's bring this to life in words. Mm. And they were fascinated about and they were very excited. Have you ever done anything like this before, Alita? Have you written or published? This is my first book of many to come, but this is my first book, and I'm excited about it. That's fantastic. You said of many to come, so you have more in the works, like maybe a follow-up to this? Yes. Excellent. definitely. Well, how long did this first one take? Being it was your first one, I imagine it would have taken you a little longer. It sure did, but, you know, patience is a virtue, Mm. and I wanted to make sure this book was at its best. And so, of course, there were editing and drafts upon drafts, you know, rewriting, and, of course, when thoughts come into my mind, I would drop them down, and, you know, with work life and being a mom and a wife, you know, I had to really find that space where I can, you know, have a cup of coffee and write and put my thoughts on paper. And once, you know, everything came together, it just became a great story. It must have been a great moment for you then, Alita, whenever that first copy came in and you got to hold that book that you've been working on for so long. What was that like? Oh, it was exciting. It was exciting. And when I got that first copy, I was able to read it to my children's class. Oh, and wow. they were excited. That's great. I brought the book and I was able to, you know, read the book to them. It was Parent Involvement Day, and I was very much excited to actually have them be the first (laughs) to see the book and experience it. I love it. Well, this is definitely a beautiful book, and I think children and families alike are really going to be into it, and I encourage my listeners to check it out for sure. Again, the title is My Little Brother and Me. It's written by Alita Glenn, 
and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. So, of course, you can get it everywhere, like on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and iTunes and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Alita, I really appreciate you coming on the show tonight, telling me all about my little brother and me. Thanks again. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Sitting down with me now, right here at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm really happy to welcome Jose L. Gonzalez. Jose, thank you for being here with me tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, the pleasure is all mine, and I have to say congratulations. You have a new book out in stores. It's titled 90 Miles, The Culprit of Communism in the Americas. Jose, can you tell me what this is all about? Sure. In essence, the book is a true story based on true events and facts. I have evidence to support the fact, such as videotape. I have letters. I have pictures. I have a lot of documentation. I started writing the story about 20 years ago. It took me that long to be able to gather all the facts, put everything in order, and obviously complete the book. But the impetus of the book is really the love story. It's a love story with the backdrop of the Cuban Revolution and the Big Seven, which were the seven men who financially supported the organization of the Cuban Revolutionary Party that basically that was the inception of the Del Castro's revolution. Oh, wow. Jose, what was that spark that inspired you to sit down and start writing this book? My father told me so. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, what sparked it was my family. There were members of my family that were heavily involved in this story. For example, my uncle, who's now deceased, he passed away, uh, unfortunately, because of old age. But Sorry. he went to school at the University of Havana and graduated from law school with Fidel Castro, along with other men. Huh. And there were seven men, seven men, they were called the Great Seven that were the founders of the Cuban Revolutionary Party. These men got together in Union City, New Jersey, of all places, and they started fundraising in Union City, New Jersey. I have pictures, I have uh, counting records, I have, you know, everything that you want to see about this. And then I just decided to write it in the form of a screenplay because my ultimate goal, obviously, is to see it on the screen. When it comes to writing and everything, Jose, have you ever done this before, or is this your first time? My first time. <laughs> I'm a CPA. I'm a certified public accountant, right? I've been a certified public accountant for almost 40 years. I'm also a CFP. Well, what was a CFP? I left my certificate go in that case. CFP is a certified fraud examiner. Hmm. So I do know a little bit about forensics, obviously. But yeah, I've, I've been a CPA for 40 years and I've practiced here in the state of Florida and also in the state of Texas. And, you know, but I'm very proud of the book because it's a true story and it does tell a story never be foretold. And then I'll, let me give you a tip of that story so you can get a feel for it. You remember the Bay of Pigs invasion, don't you? And the Cuban Missile Crisis? Oh, yeah. Okay. The Cuban Missile Crisis was in 1962. The Bay of Pigs invasion was in 1961. But during the same, uh, approximately 24 to 48 hours before the Bay of Pigs invasion, there was another operation that yet has not been told. It was called Operations 90 Miles. Therefore, the, the title of the book. The purpose of 90 Miles was to inject 10 men, CIA operatives, operatives, into the southern coast of Cuba to determine if indeed Castro had completed construction of missile bases hmm. and if any Russian additional equipment or forces were obviously already there because they had suspected of that, but they did not know. The reason why they were able to find out is because one of the seven men was the engineer involved in the designs and the construction of that particular base. And they were able to go directly when they disembarked that night into, clandestinely into, into the southern coast of Cuba. They went straight to very close to Santo Espirito, a city in a, you know, central Cuba. And they were able to find, not only that, they found over a thousand troops, Soviet troops and heavy equipment. They found all this literally 24, 48 hours before the missiles of October. Oh, wow. And you know, excuse me, not the missiles of October, 24 hours before the Bay of Pigs invasion. I'm sorry. And that's the reason why the Bay of one, one of the reasons why the Bay of Pigs invasion failed. You see, as soon as those CIA agents found out that they, they had this armament, those missiles in Cuba, they immediately, you know, radioed back to their sub and they sent that information on to D.C., Washington. Nobody ever said that before. This is a true, true fact. Again, it's called 90 Miles, The Culprit of Communism in the Americas. It's written by Jose L. Gonzalez, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
So you can get it everywhere. Head on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or down the street at your local bookshop and you'll be able to pick this up. Well, Jose, I got to thank you so much for coming on the show and telling me about this story and, and your book. I had a really nice time talking. Thank you so much. The pleasure's been on mine. I sure hope everybody enjoys the book. I wrote it, you know, with my heart and hand. What can I say? Sitting down here right with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, author Sarah Artis. Sarah, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. That's my pleasure. I wanted to say congratulations to you. You got a new book out in stores titled The Night Funerals. This sounds really interesting, Sarah. Can you tell me about it? Well, The Night Funerals is about Mr. Fetch Nice Work, who has two occupations that he does for a living. By day, he works at a New Jersey hospital in Roswell, New Jersey, as a state-licensed medical autopsy examiner. But by night, he performs a special ceremony in honoring a client's supported loved one, calling the night funeral for anyone who comes to see him in his business residence called Fish Network Funeral Home. Sarah, what types of readers do you think would be really into the night funerals? Well, I think morticians, especially that would use this book to enhance their business, and also the general public, too. Well, Sarah, what inspired this book? What gave you the idea to write this and then publish it for the world? Well, what inspired me to write this book was many times I've heard people say, well, I can't get a babysitter to attend a day funeral, or there are boss needs in the world during the daytime hours from 9 to 5, mm -hmm. and that's what inspired me to write. When it comes to writing and publishing, Sarah, have you done this before, or is this your first time? This is my first time. How long did it take you once you started it clear up until it got out there in stores? Well, it took me three years to publish it. Not publish it, but write it. I had to write it. I had to write it. Yeah. Was there anything about the publishing end of things that you found specifically challenging? Yeah. I had to wait a while. I had to take care of the finance part of it, but I finally did what I had to do. And that can be quite the learning experience, writing and publishing for the very first time. There's so much involved. Did you pick up anything along the way, Sarah, that you could toss out there as advice for the aspiring authors? Oh, yes. Believe in their book and just write something that the world, that you can share with the world, what they would think they would like to read about. And there's nothing like seeing that finished product, the product of all that time and effort that you put into it. So, Sarah, when that first copy finally came in and you got to hold the night funerals, what was that like? I was overjoyed, and I cried tears of happiness. I sure did. Mm -hmm. Now that you've been published, Sarah, what's the most rewarding aspect of being a published author for you? Well, the most rewarding aspect is just knowing that I finally did what I had to do to create the book, accomplish my goal. Hmm. Now, looking ahead, do you think you'll be writing and publishing more? Well... Not right now. I'm not ready for that step right now. Sarah, do you have people around you who they can maybe encourage and motivate, support you, especially when you're doing things like this? Well, the very special person that encouraged me every step of the way was my late husband, Mr. Jeff Artis. Mm. He was my inspiration. He was my best friend, and he encouraged me every step of the way. Without him, I couldn't have done it. When it came to thinking about things like the cover, what the book's actually going to look like, Sarah, was that a challenge for you, or what was that like? Well, that was the challenge because I already knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be simple, yet have eye appeal. Yeah, I didn't want it to be too fancy. You know, Sarah, often when you're driven to write, it, it also means you might be a good reader. You really enjoy reading as well. What kind of a reader are you? Well, I like different books about romance, mystery, cookbooks. Just like anything, I enjoy reading other books. Yes, I either do. And when you think about everything that went into the night funerals, how did your past experiences and things that you've gone through in your life played into this? Well, I've lost more than five people in my lifetime since I've been young and now I'm older. And it's very heartbreaking to lose a loved one or a special friend. That's heartbreaking, too. And then I have come to rely on the comfort and insurance of a mortician that was very thoughtful and caring and understanding about that loss. I think readers are going to be really into this book, and I encourage those listening to go check it out. Again, the title is The Night Funerals. It's written by Sarah Artis, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
So you can get this one anywhere. Get onto Amazon, go over to Barnes & Noble, get onto iTunes, or take a walk down the street to your local bookshop, and you'll be able to pick this up. Sarah, thank you again for joining me here tonight and telling me all about the night funerals. I had a nice time talking with you. Okay, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it too. Thank you. I Love You More Than You Love Me. Well, that's the new book. It just hit stores. It's written by Kelly Blankenship, and Kelly is here with me now. I get to find out more about this. Kelly, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me what readers can expect when they open up I Love You More Than You Love Me? Well, actually, young readers would see a colorful home with two little girls and a daddy, a fabulous daddy who's done things with them and spent a lot of time with them as they grew up. And most likely older for the parents, actually, would probably see a little bit hidden story behind it. Uh, a little sad, in a way, for the adult, if they, you know, because it's about losing a parent, mm. actually. So you would say this is a book, then, for all ages? It is. It absolutely is. Can maybe be a better parent, and kids can get a little closer with their parents. A parent's drawn closer to their children. Mm, I love it. Uh-huh. Kelly, what inspired you to write this? How would you get the idea for it? Well, I lost my dad. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was struggling. And I was taking out him constantly. And as I did that, I would just would start making notes. And I would like these little rhymes would pop in my head. And all of a sudden, I would all the messy sheet of paper. And I had all this stuff. And I just kind of went together, put it all together. And I thought, you know what? People need to see this. People need to know. Uh, or write it out or pour it out. Pour out your feelings on this paper. Maybe it would help them deal with losing a parent. Well, Kelly, when it comes to writing books and publishing and all of that, uh, are you new to this or have you done it before? No, I have not. I don't even know that I'm an actual writer. I think I just wanted to make Dad live forever, actually, mm. in that book. That was my whole plan. Mm. Well, you are a writer. You're a published author, so <laughs> you're a writer now, whether you like it or not. Yeah, congratulations. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's such a big deal. You know, so many people say, yeah, one day I'm going to write a book. Yeah. But how many actually do that? And you actually did it, Kelly. That's huge. And, you know, before you called, I was actually sitting here thinking that I don't even know how I come to that conclusion that I was going to do that. I don't even know why I did it. Was, I was just had this tug on my heart to do this, to pour this out on this book and this paper. And, and it just kept on coming. And all the words just kept on falling into place like they were supposed to. I just I think it was a blessing. It was meant to be. How long of a process was that for you? Was it a long time to write this? Well, actually, I just started making all the notes, and that was, uh, no, not really. It was a couple months because it wasn't really a big book. It didn't have a lot of words on it. Mm. But I had to sit down and then put all the paragraphs together. You know, how I wanted to flow through the book through our ages, through being young and then going up to his last days, actually. And then there's the whole publishing end of things, which has so much involved in it. Kelly, what did you find particularly challenging about that end of things? Well, when it comes to, I had to describe each page. I had to put the word onto a page, and then I had to describe that page. And when I looked at it, it was a big challenge, but then after I started doing it, it was so easy hmm. because it all it's all real. Every bit of it happened. That's me and my sister. That's all true. Every page is true. So it kind of made it easier that way because I knew. Mm. Well, being such a personal book, I could only imagine that moment when you finally got your first physical copy in the mail and you got to hold it and look at this thing for the first time. Kelly, what was that like for you? It was amazing. It was probably one of the one of the best feelings that I'd ever felt when I opened up that box and got those first five books. What, the anticipation of it was maddening because I couldn't wait. I knew I was keeping one, but I already knew where four were going. And I couldn't wait to get those in the mail to my son, my sister, and my mother and my stepmother. So, yeah, I did that that same night as soon as I got off. They mm. went right in the mail to them because I could not wait for them to open them and see my name at the bottom and then see that in it. Well, I think a lot of people are going to get an awful lot out of this really important book. I encourage my listeners to go seek this out. Again, the title is I Love You More Than You Love Me. It's written by Kelly Blankenship, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
So you can get it everywhere like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Kelly, I really appreciate you coming on the show and telling me all about this wonderful book. Thanks again for being here. Thank you for having me, too. Well, I'm looking at a book right now that's a story of triumph and tragedy, and it's told in a uniquely engaging style by a true storyteller. That storyteller is Greg M. Schultz, RN, and the book is called Behind the Locked Door, A Psychiatric Nurse's Story. Greg's here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and I get to learn all about this book. Greg, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Corey. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time, Greg. Could you tell me all about Behind the Locked Door? Okay. Well, it's about my time working on psychiatric units, and I've been a psychiatric nurse since 1993 and was in that field since 1988. And I ran into a lot of things. I learned a lot along the way. And I, I just thought I would share it with people. But there is a backstory behind the backstory. <laughs> and that being that, you know, along the way, uh, you get on social media and whatnot. And so I decided to get on Facebook for reasons of my own and would check it out and whatnot. And one day I just felt like writing about a trip that I had made. And I just put it out there for the public, and I got several people who I never heard of before saying, hey, you're, you're a good writer and whatnot. I said, oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I would join various groups on Facebook, and, you know, they'd be on topics like national parks you like to visit or cemeteries or whatever. Mm. And I would read people's stuff, and I'd say to myself, well, how could you make that more interesting and, and more personal and whatnot? And mm. so I would write it from that angle, and I'd have complete strangers from around the country telling me, hey, I want to buy your book. And I'm looking in the mirror and saying, I don't have a book. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to myself, well, what the heck, maybe I should write a book. And with those groups and whatnot, of course, I'd let my imagination just go wild. And sometimes the administrators would say, okay, that's enough. <laughs> and then Greg wouldn't be part of the group anymore. <laughs> but some of those people that enjoyed what I wrote continue to be my Facebook friends and whatnot and still give me lots of uplifting comments and that sort of thing. Anyhow, I said to myself, well, not only what do you like, but what do you know? And I said, I know the psychiatric business and I know what it feels like to be there. And I also know that, but for the grace of God, it could have been me or my family. Mm. As a matter of fact, it was my mother. I once toured the big facility in Traverse City, Michigan. It's now closed. You know, they closed all those state hospitals for the most part. I did work at one that's still there to this day. And I kind of wanted to see it because my mother was pregnant for me while a patient there at the state hospital. Mm. I do mention that in the book. So that really piqued my interest. Of course, I didn't know that till I was 13 years old. You, you listen to your mother talking about being at the most infamous state hospital there is. You know, when mm. we were kids growing up in the 50s, we used to insult each other saying things like, well, you belong at Traverse City. <laughs> and then it turns out, well, my mother was in Traverse City. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but she moved on and my master's degree plus 30 credits beyond that as a high school teacher. So my interest in life was rather set, although life does come along, you know, bills and children and so forth. But one day I washed up on the shores of the psychiatric hospital and I did my best to learn what I could learn and made a mistake every day and did something right every day. I had a lot of people telling me that I made their lives better. Also along the way, let me say this. When I went to nurse's school, I had to take English composition, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And the instructor took me aside and said, you need to be a writer. And, of course, <laughs> it was a matter of, yeah, tell my mortgage that. <laughs> but now I'm a retired man, and I sat down and I wrote. I'm happy I did. Well, I think a lot of people are going to get a really well-rounded look at the psychiatric system here in this book. And again, the title is Behind the Locked Door, A Psychiatric Nurse's Story. 
This is written by Greg M. Schultz, RN, and is published by Christian Faith Publishing, so you can get it everywhere. Go on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, even traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to pick this up. Well, Greg, thanks again for stopping by the show here and telling me all about your work. I had a nice time chatting. Well, I really appreciated it, Corey, and I sure did appreciate talking to you. What would you think if you woke up one day on a nice sandy beach equipped with everything you need for an extraordinary adventure? Well, that's the question posed by this new audiobook titled Imagi Island. It's written by Christina Judding, and I'm going to find out a little bit more about this audiobook. Christina is here with me now. Christina, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Christina, what can readers and listeners of the audiobook expect in Imagi Island? So Anandi Island was truly a work of love. I originally wrote for my kids, but what it does is it walks you through a magical island where you meet all sorts of different friends, whether it's mermaids, unicorns, penguins, and narwhals, and you get to know a beautiful place, all while learning how to be in the moment and breathe. So it has the different tips and strategies to help children deal with mindfulness and deal with the stressors in life while having a really good story to go along with it. What sorts of readers do you think is this best suited for? So it's primarily written for children, but I have some adults say that they enjoy reading it themselves too. How long of an endeavor was this for you once you got the idea, sat down, started writing it up until the audiobook was produced? Oh, so I started out publishing the book in print format first. So that took a couple of years, and then it's taken a little less than a year to get it as an audiobook. And when it comes to the audiobook, what was it like to hear this book as opposed to reading it off the page? It was honestly just a real blessing for me. I wanted to have someone who sounded like a grandma reading to her grandchildren. And I felt when I listened it to the first time, I was transporting myself being a child listening to my grandma read the book I wrote. So it was very special. Mm. And when it comes to writing and being published, Christina, are you new to this or have you done it before? This is my first book, my first time. So it's been a very exciting experience for me. Oh, congratulations. What was it like when we talk about the hard copy now, when you finally got that first hard copy in and you actually got to hold this thing you've been working on for so long? Honestly, at first I go, wow, I, you know, it, I was just surprised that I wrote it. Something that was originally I wrote for my children, to something I could read to them. And then as I wrote it, I thought, wow, maybe this can help other children. Because I really believe that if we can learn different tips on how to kind of deal with stressors in life, it can help us as we reach adulthood. So being able to read it to my kids in a hard copy format was truly magical. So can't completely just describe the feeling, but it was great. Mm. Do you see yourself maybe doing more and writing more in the future? I would love to. I started a sequel in a sense, but yes, I would love to. When it came to the publishing end of things, there's so much involved in that. Christina, what did you find the most challenging part of that? I think that once I wrote it, I felt like, okay, I'm done. I've written this book. But then there's so much that goes into the editing and reviewing many different copies that I didn't expect. So having kind of a little bit more of an editor lens myself going through this to make sure that everything was up to what I wanted definitely took some time in getting used to. We have a lot of first time and aspiring authors listening to us right now, Christina. So is there anything you could toss out there to them as advice, especially things that you might have picked up along the way of doing this for the first time? I would just say that I, I think that in this world, we need stories. It's a human thing, having stories within us that we want to share and give others. So I encourage you to pursue it, to write those words that are in your soul, share it and pursue it. And there's different avenues, whether it's self-publishing or hybrid or seeking a more traditional route. But believe in yourself and kind of pursue what option is going to be best for you in your situation. For you now, what's the most rewarding aspect of being a published author? When I had friends, family, acquaintances come up to me and say, I know you're a published author. I read your book, and it was just such a wonderful thing to read my kids. I really think that children and adults alike are really going to be into this book. I encourage everybody listening to check out the audiobook, too. Again, this is Imagi Island, written by Christina Judding. 
and published by the Audiobook Network, so pick it up anywhere that you normally get your audiobooks, like on Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or over on Amazon. Christina, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me all about Imagi Island and what you're doing. I had a nice time talking with you. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Mindful Movement. Heal your back pain with BAM therapy. It's the name of the new book. It just hit stores. It's written by Dr. David Tannenbaum, D.C., and Riza Shepard, and one of the co-authors, Riza, is here with me now, and I get to find out more about this book. Riza, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. I appreciate you being here tonight. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Well, the pleasure's all mine. Riza, what can readers expect when they crack open Mindful Movement? Well, I have been a Pilates instructor for, believe it or not, close to 50 years. Wow. And I've always loved Pilates. I mean, I've just felt like it was the best thing to do for your body. And I also have always been very involved with metaphysics and how the mind can so direct the body in terms of, you know, if it malfunctions or whatever the problems are going on, it usually is stemming not just from a physical problem, but many times from a belief or a thought system that is creating that as well. Interesting. So... Where Joe Pilates always believes in mind, body, and spirit, a lot of the spirit has been lost nowadays. I mean, mind and body is terrific, but it's just very, very sort of robotic. You want to bring in the spiritual, and when I say spiritual, I just mean that which is within the consciousness of each person. And many times, different areas of the body can represent different ways of thinking. If your hip is bothering you in many times, that represents metaphysically. Sometimes, I mean, it's not for everybody. You just kind of look at each person's life moving forward in life. And so you see, well, where am I having trouble moving forward in life? And then you might go, aha, well, here or there or there. And then you combine that with the exercise that helps release the hip problem, maybe through leg lift or stretching or any kind of Pilates or any kind of a fitness movement. But you also have to untie that mental knot that is going along with the physical knot. So if you can make it a whole trinity of, of healing, mind, body, and that personal person, that personal spirit that is you and you alone. Hmm. Riza, who were you writing this for? Were there target readers? The target of readers is actually anybody who is open to understanding how the mind can operate throughout the body. It's pretty well known. I mean, people say, oh, the stress is from this or that. But a lot of our physical maladies also come from a belief it could have happened something when we were very young, could have happened as recently as yesterday. We're all made up. We're all different, unique individuals. And so how we treat the body is called so how we treat our mind and ourselves. So it's just important to add positive information. You know, in other words, if you're doing 500 leg lifts, if you kept saying you hate your legs, you hate your legs, you're ugly, no amount of leg lifts are going to make those legs look good. You have to combine the mental attitude of the legs are lengthening, the legs are working along with the physical. So it's just those that are willing to say there's another tool in the toolbox. You have a particular problem with your body. It's the lower back. It's the middle back. It's the upper back. We all have problems with our back. The back represents the entire support system of the body. So in what ways do we not feel supported sometimes? Were we not supported by our parents? Are we not supported by our... You know, I can't answer these questions. I'm not a psychologist. However, I just give tools that people can say, oh, maybe this is a part of it, or that's a part of it, or maybe this is causing my foot or my back problems. Mm. And then we replace those negative ideas with some, which I call a spiritual mind treatment, which is just, again, putting into our subconscious mind those ideas that will help to heal the particular problems in the body. So it's mind and body, but it's also spirit, that spirit that is unique to each and every person. Again, it's titled Mindful Movement, Heal Your Back Pain with BAM Therapy. It's written by Dr. David Tannenbaum, D.C., and Riza Shepard, and is published by Newman Springs Publishing, so you can get it everywhere, like over on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. 
Well, Reza, I had a really nice time talking with you. Thanks again for coming on the show. Well, I appreciate you having me. Whispering Hope, Heeding the Still, Small Voice. That's the name of the new book written by Themba Levi J. Mafico. And Themba's right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we get to talk all about this book. Themba, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. The pleasure's mine. Themba, what can readers expect when they open up Whispering Hope? When they open up Whispering Hope, they expect a lot of motivation, especially if they're going through what I went through, obstacles all around me, poverty all around me, not knowing where to go, sometimes not knowing what to eat. And the book tells that once you can withdraw from the noises, even of friends, of church, or for anything, and be by yourself with God and asking the question why, you end up by hearing a whispering voice quite faint, but that the voice is pregnant with the hope. And after listening to it, you have determination, perseverance, and you are filled with the hope that I can make it and my tomorrows are better than my today. That is basically what the book is all about. Hope, faith, and inspiring determination and perseverance. Then, but what kinds of readers do you think would be most into this book? I find it is really readily useful for every type of person. Those who have made it in life, they may find that their children need to be motivated. But mainly, I would say pastoral care specialists, seminarians, pastors, they need to read this book in order to inspire their congregations. Mm. Many times we preach about heaven. But the worrisome thing is about what to do with the todays. What do I eat today? How do I buy medication? How do I do this and that? To make it through this side of heaven is what worries many people. And therefore, if pastors read this book, they might be able to inspire their congregation to keep hoping because hope and faith and the love are the three things which are really cardinal to enjoying the world. Atemba, when it comes to writing and publishing, have you ever done this before, or is this your first one? No, I wrote another book on justice, but it was from the highly academic side, and I'm trying now to simplify it, but it was where I'm spelling out that the word justice, as we say it in the Bible, doesn't reflect what the ancients meant by justice. Hmm. We are now more influenced by our modern translation of justice, modern knowledge of justice, which is really a corruption of the biblical idea. So that is what I wrote, the emergence of Yahweh as the charge among the gods, a study of the Hebrew root, S-P-T. That is available from Amazon as well, as well, Melon Press. With Whispering Hope, uh, how long of an endeavor was that for you from when you first started and sat down writing it clear up until it was published? It really took me quite a long time because one thing I find is writing about yourself is harder than writing about someone else. So I wrote 300 and something pages and cut it to 172 pages. And that is where it is now. And I'm now working on another one, which is a sequel to this one. And it's more of a meditation. How we see angels or feel angels and how the angels we meet today are similar to the angels the ancients met in the Bible. Well, I think this is a book that's going to be a great resource for a lot of people. And I encourage my listeners to seek this title out. Again, it's Whispering Hope, Heeding the Still, Small Voice. It's written by Themba Levi J. Mafico, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. So you can find it on Amazon, over at Barnes & Noble, on iTunes, and also at traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Themba, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me all about Whispering Hope and what went into it. I had a nice time talking with you. 
Thank you. I also enjoyed talking with you. And I hope the readers will take your word very seriously, your advice, and buy the book. I'm delighted to be joined by author Janie Regglesworth here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Janie, welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Well, I just wanted to say congratulations. You have a new book out titled Sebrina, the First Seahorse Unicorn, The Adventure Begins. Janie, can you tell me about it? Well, it is a book about bullying. Hmm. I taught special education for 30 years. I was a public school teacher, and I taught the cognitively impaired kids. And on occasion, just like any other kid, they would get bullied. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we would have to do a lot of discussions about it. And there were also a lot of other social issues that my kids experienced. And I always wanted to do something to help my kids figure out how to deal with situations in life. And so when the pandemic hit, I decided to write a book about bowling on And that's how it started. Hmm. When it comes to the kids, would you say that this is for all ages of kids or younger kids, older kids? It's more for, I would say, six-year-old to like 10 or 11-year-old. And when it comes to writing and being published, Janie, have you ever done anything like this before? Never. It is way outside my comfort zone. Yeah, in fact, English was not one of my best subjects. <laughs> wow. Well, how long did this take you to do once you sat down and began it clear up until it got out there in stores? Well, during the pandemic, I sat down and I was bored and I loved to draw and I loved to paint. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to write a children's book. So I sat down and I wrote some notes on different topics that I wanted to write about. First one I wanted to write was about bullying. And then I thought about other topics. I have my best friend is gay, and I wanted to write a book on the topic of acceptance of people with alternative lifestyles. And I also have family members that have married into race people. And so I wanted to write something about that. And cell phones, I really see a lot of problems with the use of cell phone, especially with kids not paying attention to what they should be paying attention to, mm. not having social interactions as much when they have the cell phones or the computers on and different things like that. Mm-hmm. All those different topics came to mind. So I sat down during the pandemic and had a lot of months. I actually have five books already written. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I want to make it a series. It's fantastic. Yeah. And I have the second one all ready to go. I've got it illustrated, and I've got it because I illustrated my book also. Oh, wow. And the second one is going to be on cell phone misusage and texting. I mentioned texting and the first day at school for the fish world. I think I get better writing each book, so it's become kind of fun for me. Wow, I love it. Now, this is the first book of the series, and it's your first book that you've ever published. So what was it like that day when it finally came in and you got to hold it and look at this thing for the first time? I couldn't believe it. It was a dream come true. It was way outside my comfort zone because (laughs) I'm, you know, afraid that people aren't going to like it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they're going to think my outlook is cheesy or whatever. But it was a really nice accomplishment in my life. Mm. Now, talking about the publishing end of things, Janie, what did you find the most challenging part of it? Was there anything in particular? I think waiting. The waiting, you know, you have to wait for this and wait for that and wait for this. Because it took about seven or eight months from when I presented my manuscript and it was accepted to get that book in my hand. And so I'm not a patient person, (laughs) (laughs) at least as far as waiting. I think this book will open up a lot of discussions about a lot of important topics, and I encourage my listening audience to go pick this one up. Again, it's titled Sebrina, the First Seahorse Unicorn, The Adventure Begins. It's written by Janie Regglesworth, and it's published by Newman Springs Publishing, so you can get it anywhere, like over at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or down the street at your local bookshop. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Absolutely, Janie. Thanks again for joining me here on the show. I had a really nice time. 
Thank you very, very much. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.